Greetings again. Once again, I've had computer problems. I got my big computer back only to discover that the technician had covered up the microphone aperture for the internal microphone, so I was unable to record. So I might uh, have to take off next week and see if I can actually get things done. We'll see what happens. Today's lectionary reading comes from Genesis 45, and it's a wonderful story of Joseph's reconciliation with the brothers who had sold him into slavery some 13 years before. But this epic moment really cries out for context. That is the story of the events leading up to the reconciliation and then its aftermath. So I'd like to fill in those details. The only artworks I could find that deal with this portion of Joseph's story really come under the title of decorative art. The works you'll see by Pontormo were designed to celebrate a marriage which united two very distinguished families in Florence and formed part of a series used to decorate the bedchamber of this illustrious couple. The other two major works were commissioned to de decorate chapels in two cathedrals, one in Venice, the other in Toulouse, France. Now, I don't mean to suggest that all work that is done for private residences or for churches is merely decorative. Obviously, some of the greatest works of art we know were expressly created for private dwellings and churches. Great works of art demand attention, patient looking, and careful thought. Any investment of time and study on the viewer's part is amply rewarded. But what I'm going to show you today doesn't rise to that high standard, I have to admit. What you see is what you get. You won't be rewarded by greater insights if you spend a long time looking. These are colorful, appealing, decorative images. And today they serve to advance the narrative of the story. To supplement these works, I've chosen the exquisite illustrations by Gustave Doré, done explicitly for the lavishly produced French edition of the Bible in 1866. I've used all of the images, not so much for their inherent interest, but to accompany the narrative of the story of Joseph, which is a fascinating one that deserves telling. You'll recall that last week, we left Joseph imprisoned in a tower with two other prisoners, Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker, after Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of sexual assault. One night, while in prison, both the cupbearer and the baker have dreams which trouble them, the meaning of which they can't understand. Joseph, dismissed, if you remember, by his brothers as that dreamer, has the gift from God of being able to interpret dreams. He offers to interpret the dreams of his fellow prisoners and correctly prophesies that the dream of the cupbearer indicates he will be released in three days' time and restored to his former position. Sadly for the baker, Joseph correctly foretells that he too will be released, but then he will be summarily executed. Joseph requests that the cupbearer remember him when he is returned to the service of Pharaoh and speak favorably to Pharaoh on his behalf, which the cupbearer promptly forgets. Pontormo gives us the scene of the cupbearer once again serving Pharaoh in the foreground of this picture, but in the background at the top of the painting, we see the baker being dragged out of the door at the top of the stairs then brought reluctantly down the stairs, and finally being led away to his death on the bottom right. Pontormo was a Florentine painter of the Mannerist school, which defined itself by defying all the traditions of classical Renaissance art. In Mannerism, the rules of perspective, proportion, balance, and harmony are frequently violated. Human figures are often elongated, depicted in strange positions, and they frequently zigzag or spiral across the canvas in improbable ways. Bright and unusual colors are favored, as we see here. So two years pass and Joseph is still in prison, although because he is a model prisoner, he has been put in charge of all the other prisoners and has earned the trust of the captain of the guards. 
One night, Pharaoh has two dreams that trouble him deeply. And when he awakens, he summons his wise men and magicians and demands that they give him an interpretation, tell him what the dreams mean. But they're stumped. They can't do it. And it is then that the cupbearer metaphorically slaps his forehead and remembers Joseph. He tells Pharaoh that when he was in prison, there was another young man, a Hebrew, who was in charge of all the other prisoners there. And this Hebrew had voluntarily interpreted both his and the baker's dreams absolutely correctly. So Joseph is summoned to appear before Pharaoh and asked to interpret the ruler's dreams. Joseph says, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So Pharaoh tells Joseph of his dream of seven cows, fat and sleek, standing and grazing beside the Nile. They are followed by seven scrawny, ugly cows coming up out of the Nile. And these seven scrawny cows devour the seven fat ones. The second dream pictured seven heads of grain, plump and rich, growing on a single stalk. But after them, he saw seven thin, withered heads of grain, which swallowed up the good grain. What did it all mean? And here we have Doré's illustration of Joseph before Pharaoh doing the dream interpretation. It's a gorgeous image, but to be fair, Doré benefited from the new field of Egyptology, which had sprung up after Napoleon's invasion of Egypt from 1798 to 1801. Over the course of the next five decades, vast amounts of source material was made available to Europeans about ancient Egypt. The Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799, which led to the deciphering of Egyptian hieroglyphics in 1822. Gradually, all things Egyptian were the rage, and you can see from Doré's illustration that he knew a heck of a lot more about ancient Egypt than Pontormo did, or anybody else who was an artist before 1800. And it's not just that Doré gets the architecture and wall inscriptions right, but he manages to give every individual an intriguing, distinctive expression. I think Doré's work repays concentrated attention far more than Pontormo's. But to continue our story, Joseph tells Pharaoh that God's message in both dreams is the same, and the fact that the dreams are doubled signifies that the matter is absolutely decided in God's mind. He says that for seven years there will be abundant harvests throughout Egypt, and that Pharaoh must store up ample supplies during these years, because these years will be followed by seven years of catastrophic famine. Someone must be put in charge, both to manage the collection and the storage of the grain throughout Egypt, but also to manage the distribution of the grain when the seven lean years come. Pharaoh has been so impressed by Joseph's wisdom and prescience that he appoints him to be the administrator of this 14-year project, second only to Pharaoh in power. Here we see Giovanni Battista Tiepolo's rendition of this moment. Pharaoh has presented Joseph with the gold chain he wears around his neck, and here Pharaoh is giving him his ring, which will be a symbol of his supreme authority to make decisions on Pharaoh's behalf throughout the land. Tiepolo was the most sought-after painter in 18th century Venice, and his specialty was large-format wall paintings including ceilings. This picture is meant to be seen from a distance, because then all the details blend and work together. Seen up close, as we do here, it doesn't work quite so well. What Tiepolo does capture well is the three-dimensionality of the space. With the figure near us, the viewers on the left, who is sharply situated, just in front of him, the hand of Pharaoh, brightly illuminated by a beam of light, which catches his hand and Joseph's face as he tentatively reaches forward 
to touch the jewel that Pharaoh is offering. Needless to say, nothing here resembles ancient Egypt, but it does nicely capture the drama of the moment when Pharaoh elevates Joseph to a position of unparalleled power. The story continues with Joseph being given a chariot to carry him on his various missions throughout Egypt. And here we have a picture that is called The Triumph of Joseph by the Frenchman Hilaire Pader, featuring his own self-portrait as Joseph. Many of the characters point to Joseph or look up adoringly at him, while a young page and a seated woman on the right look out at us, the viewers, as though summoning us, too, to prostrate ourselves before such a magnificent ruler, or perhaps before the artist, as he passes by. It gives the expression over the top a whole new meaning. So back to the story. Just as Joseph predicted, seven years of abundance pass, and he carefully sees to the storage of plenty of grain throughout the kingdom, and then the years of famine arrive. The famine is widespread and even reaches the land of Canaan, where Joseph's father, Jacob, and his 11 brothers begin to suffer. Jacob hears that there is grain in Egypt and sends his sons, all except Benjamin, to buy grain there. Thinking that Joseph is dead, Jacob has fixed his special attention on Benjamin, the youngest child and the only other child besides Joseph that had been born to his first most beloved wife, Rachel. Benjamin must be protected at all costs. So 10 brothers journey to Egypt. Here we see them as conceived by Pontormo coming before Joseph to plead their case, hoping to be able to buy grain from him. Now, they don't recognize Joseph, who appears in dress and comportment to be an Egyptian. He speaks only in Egyptian through an interpreter and is clean-shaven, unlike his brothers who will normally have been bearded. Joseph, however, recognizes them, and now the tables are completely turned. Joseph quizzes the brothers about their background. Who are they? Is their father living? Where did they come from? The brothers tell him about their father and about their youngest brother, who has not accompanied them to Egypt. Joseph pretends not to believe them. He accuses them of being foreign spies, and so commences a series of tests Joseph puts to his brothers through which he hopes to see if they are still as they used to be or if they have changed for the better. Joseph says he will give them the grain, but only on condition that they come back to Egypt with their youngest brother to prove that they're telling the truth. In the meantime, he will keep one of the brothers, Simeon, as collateral in order to assure their return to Egypt. The brothers talk amongst themselves, unaware that Joseph can understand them. He overhears them speak of their bitter regret over what they did to him years before. He hears them say that all of this misfortune has come upon them as punishment for their crime. When he hears this, he has to turn aside because he begins to weep. So the brothers go back to Canaan with the grain and find that the money they used to pay for it has reappeared in their own baggage. They're miserable. Not only do they have to ask their father to release Benjamin so that they can bring him back to appear before Pharaoh, but the, with the money used to buy grain once again in their baggage, they'll probably be accused by the Egyptians of theft. Reuben tries hard to persuade Jacob to release Benjamin, and pledges his own two sons in exchange if he does not return from Egypt with Benjamin. Now, personally, if I were one of the sons, I would have been tempted to say, thanks a lot, Dad. But Jacob is unmoved. He will not release his beloved Benjamin. He's already lost his favorite son, Joseph, 
he will not be able to bear the loss of Joseph's brother. You see what Joseph is doing here by pushing the brothers to produce the newly favored brother, Benjamin. He's trying to find out if they will treat his younger brother as callously as he himself was treated. After all, it was the special paternal favor that had so angered the brothers to the point that their jealousy pushed them to near murder. Had they changed at all? That is the test. Eventually, the famine gets so bad that Jacob once again wants to send the brothers, minus Benjamin, to Egypt to buy grain. The brothers tell him they cannot return to Egypt without Benjamin. Or the viceroy of Egypt, that is to say Joseph, will be convinced that they have been lying and are spies. And since their money had been found back in their baggage after the first trip, they'll be accused of theft as well. Finally, it is Judah who assumes full responsibility. His life will be in Jacob's hands if they do not return to Jacob with Benjamin. Jacob at last relents with much lamentation and a huge heaping helping of oy vey, a lot of self-pity. So back the brothers go with Benjamin to Joseph in Egypt. Here Pontormo shows us their appearance in Egypt with a very European landscape in the background. He shows it in two stages. First on the left in procession with little Benjamin in the blue robe and then on the right before Joseph, who is the figure in front of Benjamin in the blue and salmon colored robes as he introduces his younger brother to Pharaoh, who is very improbably dressed as a medieval knight, hand on hip on the far right. Joseph is so moved at the sight of his younger brother that he once again has to hide himself lest they see him weeping. But there will be one final test. After Joseph sells them the grain they wish, he invites them all to a feast. Joseph will not eat with them because Egyptians will not eat with Hebrews, but they notice as they sit down that their places are all arranged in the exact order of their ages. How did the Egyptian know this? They're uneasy and, un and eager to get away. They feel something isn't quite right. Just before they set off on the return trip, Joseph has one of his servants take his own silver goblet and hide it in Benjamin's sack. The brothers depart and only manage to travel a short distance before they're stopped by a steward that Joseph has sent after them. He accuses them of stealing Joseph's personal silver goblet, which he drinks from and with which he practices divination. How could they have returned his hospitality with such a wicked act? The brothers are nonplussed and swear up and down that they didn't steal the cup, but the steward forces each one to open his sack. Whichever brother is revealed to have stolen the goblet will die, and the rest become slaves. So the brothers lower their sacks to the ground and open them for inspection, beginning with the eldest, proceeding one by one down to the youngest. And of course, the goblet is found in Benjamin's sack. The brothers are distraught and tear their clothes, but they have to return to face Joseph. All they can do is throw themselves on his mercy. There's nothing they can say. They submit to him and will all be his slaves. But Joseph is generous. In a change from what the steward had told them, Joseph says that the rest can go free. Only the brother who stole the cup will stay in Egypt and be enslaved. At this, Judah steps forward and once again explains how Joseph has been his father's favorite, had been, but he disappeared, and their father assumes that he's dead. If now Benjamin, the only other son of Rachel, does not return, Jacob will surely die because his life is so closely bound up with love for this youngest son. Judah pleads for Benjamin's freedom and offers himself in Benjamin's place 
if only Joseph will let Benjamin return to Jacob. When Joseph sees that Judah is willing to take Benjamin's place, basically laying down his life for him, Joseph is overwhelmed with emotion. Please take a long look at Doré's absolutely fantastic image of this moment as I read you the verses of our lectionary reading today. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, don't be distressed. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and no reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it really is I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept and Benjamin embraced him weeping and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. It's such an incredible scene, such a powerful story of hatred, jealousy, violence, and loss, of suffering and injustice. But before all else, it's a story of redemption and reconciliation. And Joseph has such a visionary perspective on all these events. It is not you who sent me here, but God to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Few people, after enduring such hardship, can take such a long view and see God's hand at work in everything. In the chapters that follow, Jacob is told that his son is alive and is all-powerful in Egypt. Jacob decides that he must follow the counsel of his beloved son, his son who is alive, and he sets off with all his possessions to dwell in the land of Goshen, one of the richest and most fertile areas of Egypt, which will be perfect for pasturing his herds of sheep, goats, and cattle, as well as all the livestock that Joseph and even Pharaoh will give him. Two final images of Jacob as he arrives in Egypt and is met by Joseph. The first is so unlike anything Egyptian that it's almost hilarious. It shows Joseph in the red cape, elaborate turban, and brown leather boots, bending down to embrace the father he has not seen for so long. This is by the Dutch artist Salomon de Bray. But once again, I think the prize has to go to Doré. With this majestic scene of Jacob's arrival in Egypt, 
on an elaborately festooned camel with all of his flocks crowding around him, as well as all his servants and extended family. So it is that the story of Joseph comes to a close, as well as the long saga of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is how the Israelites ended up in Egypt. And when the story picks up again in the book of Exodus, they will have been in Egypt 400 years and find themselves in a far more difficult situation than we see them in here. Hope to see you next week. In the meantime, be blessed, be well.